We have the pleasure to hear from two of Corey College's biggest champions and innovators, President Joseph E. Oyun and Dr. Eamon Corey. Their vision and support have been instrumental to where we are as a college, our success to date, and to no surprise, they have big plans for our future. So please join me with a warm round of applause as we welcome these two leaders to the stage for a fireside chat about Corey's future. This one is good. Good afternoon. We have empty seats. We cannot start if we have empty seats. So please come closer. Come closer. Come come close to us. And you can get better pictures here. You can have better questions. Well, that's not clear. That's not clear. Hi Larry. Agnes. Hello everyone. I mean, the purpose of uh, this chat is for all of you to get to know more about uh, Eamon, about his vision. But let me start by telling you a story. Last week, uh, we had the board meeting at Mills College. And you know that Mills College now is Mills College at Northeastern. And so on the way back, you know, and Eamon, you know, was showing, he was telling me, you can put your, uh, uh, you know, your jacket in, in the closet here. And you know how to open it? I said, of course, I have a PhD. <laughs> so he said, I'm going to use that from now on. You know, I can open a closet because I have a PhD. <laughs> right. So let's open the closet together here. All right, let's, we'll give it a the try. The Curry closet. So... <laughs> Let's start with a little bit about your own journey. So you were a student here. Mm -hmm. You came for your uh, MBA. Correct. And you had an idea. What was the idea? Well, at that time, uh, I, was, I had already been a serial entrepreneur. And I had been successful starting companies in uh, in the medical products and services area. Uh, the father of one of the professors here financed my first venture. And you know, uh, you know him. This was Professor Gregory. His father was a venture capitalist named Dan Gregory. And Dan was one of the founders of Greylock. Uh, Greylock had, Partners, Greylock yes. Greylock Partners. And uh, I was in my mid-20s, and I had put together a business plan and I went to see Dan. I was introduced to him by a mutual friend. And he said, you know, I think this might succeed. And so he gave it a try. And it all worked out for them and for me. And at that point, I finally had some capital to begin to start other businesses. So fast forward to when I was a student here, uh, I was beginning, I was starting up an aerospace company, a company that eventually came to be uh, the largest company, the leader in the world in the manufacture of, of equipment for the passenger cabins of airplanes, commercial airliners and also, and also business jets. And that company became wildly successful. And I started it while I was a student here, which was, which was very interesting. And uh, I was fortunate enough, and my, by the way, my two sons are also entrepreneurs, and together we've been fortunate enough to be successful enough to be able to make enough money to be able to give back. And I can tell you that giving back is so much more fun than actually starting a company or building a company or making money. If you can positively impact the lives of, of people that need help, and if you can get, if you are lucky enough to receive letters from those people, which we have as Corey scholarships, I don't know, maybe we have 90 or 100 or something like that now. Well, I read those letters every year. We've been at it for roughly 15 years. And many of those folks are now doctors and lawyers and, or they're still students. And uh, there isn't anything more gratifying than to know that you're making a positive impact on somebody else's life. And so uh, the satisfaction that you get from that is more than the satisfaction 
making money or building a company. So uh, let me go back to Eamon. Uh, uh, you went you know, and you invested in medical devices. How did you know about medical devices? You were still In very my first young. job, yeah. I worked at a research lab in Radnor, Pennsylvania. It's called the Wyeth Institute for Medical Research. Oh, yes, of course. And in this program that they put me in, it was a, something called a technical personal de development program. They had one person in it. It was me. Uh -huh. And in the program, I spent three months with the head of organic chemistry and three months with the head of inorganic chemistry and analytical chemistry and physical chemistry and so on and so forth. Look at Henderson is saying, really? <laughs> you didn't know. And while I was there, I developed some equipment for doing automatic analysis of finished pharmaceutical dosage forms, which helped the company to be able to do storage stability studies on hundreds of drugs under various conditions. And it was innovative and reduced the cost of doing all of that analytical testing. And there was a company in New York called Technicon, and Technicon was in the business of selling equipment to do automatic analysis, primarily in blood and urine, but also agricultural and uh, pharmaceutical. And they hired me, and I went to work there, helped to complete the development of the equipment, and then the manufacturing, and then they couldn't sell the equipment. This was a big problem because I had moved and I had a family and so on. So uh, I said, give me a chance to try because I understand how to use it. I then went into sales, successfully marketed the equipment, and then when I was in my mid-20s, they made me president of this small business. And from there, I went to see Dan Gregory. And then so, that's why you started your own company. Yes. So and the own, my own company was a company that did clinical diagnostic testing services using the equipment that, that I had I, developed and uh, we became the largest in the country and were acquired and I made some more money then. So why would you decide to start to become a student again and go for an MBA? I thought I, maybe I had missed something because I had <coughs> had no business training whatsoever. Uh, I love being here and uh, I was fairly successful student, as you, yeah. as you know. And, uh, and so, and I've encouraged, I've encouraged my sons. I mean, one, one got his MBA at Harvard. The other one still hasn't gone to get his MBA. I'm pushing him, I'm shoving him. You know, he's, he's middle-aged, but he should go and get his MBA. We're, we're, <laughs> we believe in lifelong learning. You know, he can come to Curie College and we'll have a combined uh, a major between I, that's what you know, Curie been. and uh, Damor McKen. That's exactly what I told him. Yeah. So we need, it, a, we need some more marketing. Maybe we, maybe we need to get uh, Ken or... Uh. <laughs> so let, let's talk a little bit about the company that you, you alluded to, that you launched, became the largest company in the world. What, what, what did you do with this? What was uh, the... So... Um, I have, I have become a, I had become a Porter devotee, Michael Porter. And Michael Porter, I think, is one of the most brilliant strategists from an academic point of view in terms of the development of businesses that maybe, you know, can one day become the leader in a niche market, which has maybe more powers than, more power than the suppliers or the, or the customers, which in an industry where maybe there isn't a uh, concentration of large companies which are well capitalized with, with technological or financial superiority. And, uh, and as I went through the Porter, my, my own Porter journey, my own Porter studies, I identified the market for the passenger cabins, of interior equipment for passenger cabins, and started small. Uh, basically with uh, equipment for, for uh, watching television or listening to the mu music or turning on the lights in, in large cabin equipment because at that time you couldn't, you couldn't reach up. You had to use yes. these devices in the seat arm. That was my first product, the device in the seat arm. From there I went to seats and from there I went to cooking equipment, then oxygen, then lighting, and then 
one thing after the other. Starting from nothing, we eventually became, you know, a $5 billion revenue company. And then you started another company next to it. It was an aviation distribution company. So once, once basically I had every aviation airliner in the world as a customer, mm -hmm. I said, you know, they're not being served very well by the disparate distribution function for component parts that exists. And so we started a business there and it became the largest in the world also. And you sold both companies? Sold both companies. So what do you sold do now? One, one, went, one is owned by Raytheon today and the other yeah. is owned by Boeing. Yeah. So what do I do today? Yeah, it, it, you, you can never stop. Let me tell you a funny story, actually it's a true story. I, you know, Eamon lo loves wine. So every time I visit him, he offers me a great wines. So I said, and he has a big collection here in uh, Jupiter and in, uh, on, in Cape Cod. And I said, so Eamon, uh, have you been buying uh, more futures? He said, no, no, I don't. I, mean, it's, it, it, I have to wait 25 years, 30 years for the wine. I don't have time for that. But at the same time, he has time to start companies and uh, <laughs> after companies, after companies. So what are you doing now? Well, wait a minute. When you asked me that question, I said I no longer buy green bananas. Uh, <laughs> you know, my memory is selective. I'm focusing on wine. I'm not interested in bananas. Yeah. So, so what am I doing now? I'm helping my two sons. One is in the uh, apartment business. Uh, he and his partner have 25,000 apartments now, so they've been growing for many years. Uh, he and his older brother together are in the business of student housing and then the older brother is also on his own in the business of manufactured housing so they're both in the real estate business uh, I help both boys to the extent I can uh, from time to time they believe I'm giving them too much help and that's when I go off and do something else uh, but I've invested in every one of their projects and uh, that's been rewarding. And, uh, and I'm helping a doctor friend of mine who had developed a, a piece of equipment which basically sanitizes the air uh, in rooms to protect from viral or bacterial infection. Um, so there are, I don't know, maybe 10 million immunocompromised pe people in the, in the world. They're infusion centers on a regular basis. And a, a bacterial infection for them can be deadly. And so having this equipment protect gives them a modicum of protection. Uh, the university has bought some of this equipment, as you know, uh, for, to protect faculty and students. And uh, so this equi particular equipment has been approved by the Food and Drug Administration now. And he's trying to turn this, the piece of equipment that he developed into a company. And because he and I were on the board of directors of Synthase together, which is a medical implant company, and we had known each other for a couple of decades. He asked me if I would help him to start the company, what I, which I did. And that was uh, a little less than two years ago. And so now it's not just a piece of equipment, it's a company. So, you know, <coughs> biotech, business, planes, Curie College. When you and I started talking about that, you know, let's bring everybody back to that. Why Curie? Why, why computer science? So I think computer science is going to be embedded in every course of study and in every industry. I mean, that's kind of, you know, so, I mean, you know brainwashing, <laughs> brainwashing. So as a matter of fact, Curie College now has 43 combined majors after just such a short time. And Corey College has total alumni today of under 11,000 alumni. Corey has enrolled today 7,500 students. So we're the f probably the fastest growing computer sciences college in the country. And whether it's computer sciences and engineering or computer sciences and business, so FinTech, or biology, or any other discipline, 
uh, it seems to me it's going to be pervasive in pretty much every industry. And I think that what we're doing here by assuring that these students are able to communicate, they're articulate, they have multiple discipline, multiple disciplinary education. Uh, I think that what we are doing is we're training tomorrow's leaders, really leaders. These are not going to be folks that are only working in a computer science laboratory. And uh, I, I think we are so, so focused on combined majors and we have a global campus system. Nobody else has that. I mean, we're, we are training computer scientists in California, in London, in Arlington, in Massachusetts, in Vancouver. It's, what we have is amazing. I mean, we're, what, we have 13 of those campuses now. We're on four continents. Uh, so the infrastructure that we've built, and now with the acquisition of uh, Mills College at Northeastern, I mean, our campus here is, was, is what, 65 acres, I think, in total. Tom, Tom will uh, add more. 75? I actually I saw one of the buildings. It has, has a mural on it right now. But, I mean, you, I... So, Tom, how many yes. acres? He's close enough. No, but uh, give us a number. It's about 70. 70. So you, you... You see, what I haven't been watching, Tom, you've been buying stuff while I haven't, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been paying attention. Yeah. But Mills College at Northeastern has 135 acres. It's a magnificent campus. And there we're going to have the opportunity to have housing for graduate students. And there, there for the first time, in a big way, we're going to be competing with Stanford and Berkeley. And with our multi-course our multi, uh, approach, multi-discipline approach, uh, combined majors, and with housing in that part of the world, we're going to do we're going to do well against both Stanford and Berkeley. I have no doubt. I yeah, we, yeah. I, I agree with you. We already, did. I mean, look, we, we have also some uh, products, curricula uh, that th no one else has. And you know, I remember when Larry Finkelstein came to, to see me and see us and say, look, we can build something uh, called Align. We didn't know whether it was going to succeed. And then Carla, Carla took it and scaled it up. And we see that this became a model because it showed the world that you under, your undergraduate learning doesn't determine what you do next. And that's huge. And now, we are seeing that our colleagues are building one in uh, data analytics, uh, etc. So let's go back. Eamon, you mentioned that we are only scratching the surface with uh, Corey. When I told you that you know, we're celebrating 40 years, it's essentially you told me we're celebrating the beginning. So what do you see next? Well, let me talk about some of the things that uh, Beth and Carla and I have talked about in the past. So one of the things that is really interesting is that 40%, 46% of the incoming student body is female. It's an amazing number. And 25% is... Why are only the females clapping? <laughs> And, and, and 25% are ethnic minorities. And it's not just that we, are, uh, that we are innovating in that area. It's the way that it's being done, which, was v which is very interesting. Because of the combined majors, we're not just out looking to bring females into the college to lower the academic standard. They're coming in because of the combined majors and we're getting the, the best and the brightest. And so we've got a really bright, really bright student body. Half of them are involved in combined majors. When I was out there last week at uh, Mills at Northeastern, it turns out that 60% of the students are computer science students in the first year. It's really, it's really amazing, yeah. amazing. So I think during my tenure, I've had Carla, and Beth, I mean, 
outstanding leaders, both. Uh, I miss you, Carla. I love you, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So you see, Car Carla, so, he misses you. That means you're not visible anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, but let, let me mention something. B Beth organized a meeting uh, with some students, some of our students. Some of them are here today. You're here. Okay. So James. <laughs> Chang Davidson. <laughs> yeah, but James sent, sent me an email afterwards, immediately afterwards. He's a great networker. Yeah, it's great. You know. So. Well, he's going to give me a ride in his electrically driven yes. Formula One automobile. Yeah, I, I mean, he, he promised me one. He promised uh, Gregory Ebaud. He promised Beth Ebaud. <laughs> yeah, but Greg is racing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, are you going to have an unfair advantage and practice before us? Well, I have an electric car. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, excuse me. So you don't need to do it. I have an electric car. So, what did you get out of this lunch? So first of all, it didn't appear to me that these were randomly selected students. <laughs> <laughs> they were all That's articulate. They were articulate. They were bright. Their questions were outstanding. Uh, one of them asked a question that I had real, really had a lot of trouble answering it. I, I had to think deeply and make something up. What was it? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't forget anything, as you yeah. know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I thought I think I am so impressed with the student body here. So impressed, and that's one of the reasons why we did what we did here at Northeastern. So my two boys and I have a family meeting on a quarterly basis. One went to Brown, one went to Harvard, okay? And one of the first things that we did was discard those two universities as a place where we wanted to do this, and why? Because the students here are here because they want to learn for the next stage of their lives and they're hardworking, they're aggressive, they're, they are, uh, they're wonderful to be around, and I know they keep you young. At Harvard and, and Brown, great institutions, but a lot of the students there have already succeeded and they're ready for retirement once they get there. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and so we decided that, we decided on Northeastern after having thought through the possibilities of Harvard and Brown. That's, that's wonderful. Let's, I mean, we have time for some questions. So if you want to ask a question, since it's live, and uh, I would like you to raise your hand, and then you will have a mic coming uh, to you. So raise your hand. Usually it takes 20 seconds before somebody raises a question. And please feel free, you know, and we'll give priority to our students. But, that's, you know, and, but since we are all lifelong learners, we're all students. So who would like to uh, ask a question? And please identify yourself. Not only your name, but what you do. Hi, my name is Xiao Yao Zhong. I'm an online student at Northeastern University. Like you mentioned, I always got a question at interview, like, why would you change your major? I have a pretty complex background. I have four different majors. The first one is law. The second one is translation. The third one is public administration. The fourth one, right now, computer science. <laughs> I always got a question like, okay, what makes you make this transition in your career trajectory? I find it really hard to answer because I feel like in the beginning, I didn't belong to computer science. No one thinks I will succeed in computer science. So. What's your suggestion for me to answer that kind of question during interview? Well, I don't want to say you're overeducated, but you're overeducated. <laughs> so, so I love it. That's I, good. I, I think you're prepared to do almost anything you want to do in life. I mean, you have, I, I think this is a great thing to go from major to major to major uh, like that because you are learning so much about so many things and you're obviously articulate and very bright. And uh, you, at some point here, you're gonna decide, maybe it's time to go to work, you know? And you can work in academe, or you can, you can work in business. 
you can work in government, you can do almost anything you want to do with the education that you have. And uh, I, I am blown away that you're in a line after all these other programs, but I think it's a fan, a line is a fantastic program. It really is. It's, it has encouraged women in particular who have maybe avoided STEM in general and science and engineering, but who actually have the capability and the interest and maybe the inclination as well. Maybe the left brain is working just fine, you know, to try it, to try it on an economic basis, which makes a whole lot of sense, and then determine that maybe they really enjoy this. And once you've done it, because of the pervasive nature of computer science and all of the other things that you've studied, you're ready to do almost anything you want to do. You need to just maybe meet with your counselor, spend a couple of hours, think about what you really enjoy doing. Uh, whatever it is, my guess is you're going to be pretty successful at it. Any other question? Yes, over there. Uh, hi, my name is Omar. I'm also an Alliance student, and I have a question for Ayman. What did uh, you do as an, uh, what kind of undergraduate studies? Oh, I studied finance and economics in undergrad. Where? Uh, abroad okay. at the American University of Sharjah. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, my question for you is, you had a bunch of businesses that you started, and I was wondering if you had intentionally come up with business ideas each time, or if you had you know, been at the right place at the right time for all of them. You know, by, by the way, you are, you're ready for fintech. You know that, right? So, yeah, I get that a lot. You get that, okay. All right. So um, I think you need to have a certain amount of luck, uh, Omar. I mean, I don't think you can do it all, you know, intellectually. Uh, but, you know, it, it's interesting. The harder you work and the less you sleep, the more luck you have. I've never slept more than three or four hours a night. And I'm, in, you know, I'm very, very inquisitive. I talk to a lot of people about a lot of things. And my guess is that if you do that and you read Porter and you start thinking about strategy the way he does and look at different industries, and in your case, you were perfectly suited to look at FinTech, which is just beginning, right? We're right at the very beginning. And you are ready to begin at the beginning. You'll, you'll find the right one. Now, it, it could make sense for someone like you to join Techstars, right, where there are some uh, already entrepreneurs beginning businesses in that area, and maybe you might go to work for one, maybe get some stock in one of those companies. And as you develop and as the business develops, you'll have other opportunities to learn, other ideas that you'll get, and maybe you'll go off on your own and start your own company. Great. Great. So. Let me put Ch James here. Can you give uh, the mic to James? Because he's getting it easy. I mean, uh, th this one. James, what did you get out of the lunch um, with uh, Dr. Khoury? Uh, I thought it was... Uh, uh, James, why don't you identify yourself? Oh, hello. I'm James Chang Davison. Uh, I'm a fourth year computer science student, uh, president of Northeastern Electric Racing, and also the chair of the Student Activities Council for the College of Engineering. Um, so I work very interdisciplinary across multiple colleges to support the undergraduate student groups. Um, uh, what did I get out of the lunch? Uh, first of all, it tasted good. <laughs> uh, but I think it's, uh, it was a very interesting experience not only to get to meet Dr. Corey uh, and kind of understand uh, the, the vision and the plan for Corey as it, we expand uh, by coastal, as you say, um, but also to actually meet some other students that are doing a lot in their co-ops and their uh, undergraduate studies. Um, so, yeah. So, is there anything that you know will you will you will remember that was a good uh, con you know, piece of advice that uh, you heard today? That's a good question. Maybe. A lot like that one question that you can't remember. Yeah. Oh, I can remember. Yeah. So, <laughs> he, he remember but he didn't want to, to, to so bring look, it. I remember you took doubles and triples, so you were hungry. <laughs> uh, too many emails to write to, okay. to uh, run. Uh, I think the, the biggest sort of piece of advice and takeaway that I got um, was to um, think out of the box um, and think 
interdisciplinary in in the the way that um, you know we're taking Cori globally and uh, bi coastal, um, like you said, uh, but with a heavy emphasis on a lot of uh, combined majors, and to look at the the way that we can bridge the gap between all these different disciplines. Um, uh, and in a collaborative manner, you know, working with students in other disciplines, especially uh, to, you know, solve the, the challenges of the future. Um, right. You mentioned a lot right. about that. Yeah, I think I think you are the folks that are going to solve the challenges of the future. Yeah. And there are some big ones. <clears throat> One of the things we talked about, if you remember, is electric cars. Mm -hmm. And where is the electricity going to come from? Exactly. And what is the what is the size and quality of the grid that we have? Right. And who is going to solve the environmental problem which goes with these non-recyclable batteries? Yeah. And where is the power going to come from to charge all these uh, automobiles? Most definitely. And, and Greg, you should be thinking about that. If you're driving an electric car, <laughs> you know, environmentally, this is not a sound thing to do. <laughs> no, 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 you can't, you can't. Give him, give him uh, uh, the mic if he wants, but you cannot, because people are listening all over the world. In certain parts of the country, you're absolutely right, and I think one of the problems we have is we don't educate consumers about the impact of their choices. So, for example, I bought a Tesla in Atlanta, and in the southeast, it's a relatively... Um, impure way of generating electricity versus in Texas or on the West Coast where it's natural gas or, or a variety of uh, renewable sources, but you, and the cost of recycling. We don't educate consumers at the point of when they purchase what the upstream and downstream implications of the technologies are, and we need to do that. Okay. That, that actually was my point. Thank you. Okay. Bert. Well, <laughs> great. So, you know, we are here to celebrate uh, the 40th anniversary. We also are celebrating Eamon and his commitment to uh, the school. The, the school, the way we look at it, has been an innovator and is an innovator. Now, there is a debate when, you know, that, you know, in, in the same way that you look at a field as being essential to everything that is being done. You know, some of my colleagues in Curie say that computer science is essential. That's a lingua franca. That every student should have that. But then they went a step further in, in their uh, thinking and say, in fact, what we want is humanics. That we want every student to be versed and have a tech literacy, a data literacy, and a human literacy. And you have manifested that through the combined majors, through the fact that the students are doing improv. And at the, I remember that this was a change. And a change that was not so easy for many of us. So from this perspective, the way we looked at and we look at Cori as we look at it as an innovator. At, you know, not only at Northeastern, but in the field. Second, we looked at Cori as another inno innovator in lifelong learning, and that's Align. You approached Align, and you were the first to take advantage of the global university system before any school here. And in some ways, the other schools now realize that they have to go beyond what you have done. So once again, you have been an innovator. And in terms also of research and faculty hiring, the school has been an innovator. I remember the, when we started talking about network sciences and you know, building network sciences here, Larry came and said, I don't care about lines. I don't care about positions. I'm ready to give, you know, the other colleges lines, whether, you know, when we recruited uh, Laszlo and when we recruited Alex or when we recruited uh, uh, David Lazar and others. So you have been really 
innovators in at the university, you have innov been innovators at the field, in the field, and now really the future is bright, but, you, but don't rest on your laurels. So we're expecting you to continue to provide us with innovations, and that's why Eamon is so excited about being engaged with this school and giving us his name and his resources and his passion and his investments. So, Eamon, you're an entrepreneur, you're a serial entrepreneur, you're an innovator. Your school is an innovative school and, as you said, I, co I couldn't agree more with you. We're only scratching the surface. We're only beginning to build the future. So let's have fun together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.